let everybody know a couple things. Um, next month uh, uh, for our May luncheon, uh, which will hopefully be our last virtual event uh, uh, through uh, COVID-19, uh, that will be um, presented by uh, Jim Garner, who's my brother. And he's going to be talking about uh, some of the newer um, FAA drone regulations coming up for 2021 and 22 and some other drone related items. Um, so our May uh, event will be, uh, of course, the second Tuesday of the month on May 11th. And then in June will be our first back in uh, person face to face. Uh, it'll be a joint venture uh, luncheon with uh, NALA, which is a Northern Appalachian Land Association. And that will actually be uh, the third Tuesday, June 15th, uh, due to the IRWA's International Educational Conference being the same week as our, our typical second Tuesday of the month. So a little change with that, but being a joint venture or a joint uh, luncheon, we thought it was appropriate that we could change the day for that. Um, also, would like to uh, let everybody know that uh, we will be hosting um, the course 213 conflict management uh, on Monday, May 10th. Uh, Gordon McNear will be our instructor uh, again, who does a great job. Um, so if you've ever taken one of his classes, you know he's very knowledgeable um, on, on the right away and it gives a little bit different perspective coming from north of the border in Canada. Um, and any time that you can watch Gordon do some of the presentations he does for the IRWA on an international level, I highly re recommend the time on it. It's it, uh, very educational and informative. Um, and uh, one more thing before we get into our presentation, and I'll be sending out some more information on it. Um, David Marks is involved in the, the Duquesne uh, Community um, Day, and uh, this year uh, on uh, August or yeah, August 6th, Friday, August 6th, they're going to be having a golf tournament um, to support the uh, Duquesne uh, community. And it'll be at Riverview Golf Course in Elizabeth, PA. It's $300 a foursome. It's open up to 18 foursomes. Is that correct, David? That is right. We're going to take the first 18 foursomes. It's at Riverview Golf Club about, uh, about 25 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. Uh, it's an annual event, and we support the Duquesne Community Day. It's the biggest picnic in the Mon Valley where everybody's invited and we, we feed uh, a couple thousand children and their, and their uh, parents. So when we send out the sign-in sheet for today, I'll include the flyer for that if you're interested in, in, in participating in that or if you want to sponsor. Last year, uh, the Pittsburgh Right Away Group uh, was a, a beverage sponsor uh, for the event and we'll probably do that again as well. I am very grateful. Uh, so, so just uh, you know, giving back to the community and, and helping uh, all the all the people affected uh, on a daily basis, but especially during COVID, you know, there's a lot of people that are less fortunate than us that you know, we can reach out and help. Um, so at at this time, I'm going to turn over um, uh, the presentation to uh, April's speakers here, and that's Mark and Mark um, uh, from Ditto Appraisals. I met them last uh, January at uh, the Pittsburgh Region Appraisal Association. I don't know, what's the official name of your group? The Appraisal Institute, but it's the, okay. uh, it is now the Western Pennsylvania chapter of the Appraisal Institute. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so at this time, I'd like to ask everybody to please uh, mute their, uh, their microphones. Um, you can ask questions in the chat, um, or uh, Mark, Mark, are you okay with people asking questions during your presentation? Will you prefer them to wait until the end? Uh, we're open to having questions as we go through. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of used to doing that, so uh, yeah, I'm, anytime there's a question, if you want to just unmute yourself, ask the question, uh, we'll take care of it. If it gets out of hand, we'll change the rules. Okay, well, usually everybody's pretty polite about it, but I would rather have a question asked than put in the chat because I can't adjust the font and I, I'm having problems seeing because I'm about five years behind on a new set of glasses. So I, I, I miss things in uh, in chats. Uh, I'll catch them later on and they're pertinent to that time period. So um, I prefer to just kind of leave it open as we're going through. 
Okay, so at this time, I'd like to t- go ahead and turn everything over uh, to Mark and Mark and and uh, get, uh, let them uh, take control at this point. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and by the way, I'm Mark, and he's Mark. Uh, I'm Mark Sr., that's Mark Jr. Um, we both work for a company called Didio, which is uh, an appraisal firm in uh, western Pennsylvania. We're located right outside the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and we have about 13 appraisers who work with us, uh, and we do uh, a variety of appraisal services. Uh, primarily what I do is I teach classes. I teach classes all over the country um, uh, on appraising. I'm an instructor with the Appraisal Institute, and I'm a, uh, an AQB uh, youth instructor, if you've ever heard of USPAP. So I'm someone who travels around the country teaching those types of programs. Now, what we wanted to do today, uh, Johnny had asked us to come on and talk about appraising, and I asked Mark uh, just where we would start with this, and he said, start at the basics. So we're going to start with the basics. I know we just have a short period of time. Uh, so we're starting with, uh, by the way, once again, Mark Smeltzer Jr., Mark Smeltzer Sr., uh, we both have a, a number of designations. If you have questions about that as we go along, we'll be glad to explain what they are. Uh, but we both have a, a number of different designations. Uh, and I was going to start with what the appraisal is. Uh, this definition uh, comes from a beautiful standard professional appraisal practice. It's a set of standards that was adopted uh, back in uh, the late 80s, uh, around 87, 88. Uh, as a uniform standard for all appraisers, primarily in the United States. We do have different sets of standards for from different countries. Uh, there's an international valuation standard that's used uh, more globally. Uh, the uniform standards, once again, United States, uh, and I believe in Canada. Uh, so what's that? CPAP. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, they have CPAP. They're trying to arrange... They're trying to work it out so that they're similar. I know that the two uh, organizations are meeting on that. Uh, but an appraisal is the act or process of developing an opinion of value. It is the opinion of value. Uh, and uh, we're just again, any time we talk about appraisal, it pertains to uh, appraising and related functions, the things we do as appraisers. Uh, the other definition I wanted to cover real quickly is an appraiser is one who is expected to perform valuation services competently in a manner that is independent, impartial, and objective. And I think this is important for everyone to understand when we're talking about uh, an appraiser. We're not on, we don't represent one side or the other, okay? We are there to be an independent, uh, basically consultant, okay, is going to go in there and look at this independently without having a dog in the fight. Uh, we're not working for the property owner. We're not working for the taking party. Uh, we're not working. We're being paid by them. However, we're there to say independently, this is what the value of this property is. Um, the uh, process we go through, and this is how we're going to approach today, is just tell you about the process we go through. Uh, the appraisal process is a systematic set of procedures an appraiser follows to provide answers to client questions about real property value. Uh, that is from the uh, Dictionary of Real Estate Appraisal. We have, we have uh, the dictionary is one of the we need somebody to mute their mic because I'm not hearing Mark anymore. Somebody's microphone is making a lot of noise. Okay, do I have an ability to mute everyone? Johnny? Okay. okay. Everyone can hear me now. Johnny, can you give me a thumbs up once you know? Here Johnny. <laughs> I'm getting a lot of noise from 412 yeah. maybe. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you, Marilyn. Oh, wait, wait. We're good now? Okay. Uh, 
by the way, when I ask questions, if you want to answer, you can give me a thumbs up, whatever. I'll, I'll know that everything is okay. Uh, anyway, we're, we're, what we're going to do is just talk about the process, a brief overview of the process, just to give you an idea of how an appraisal is done and uh, how our relationships are set up with different people. So the appraisal process, it is a process that we learn when we first get into appraising. It starts off with identifying the problem. Uh, identifying the problem, you have to think of appraising as we are problem solvers. So we go in and look at this and say, what is your problem? What is your question? And then how are we going to solve this? So the first thing we need to do is identify this problem. This goes all the way from identifying the problem all the way through reporting the answer, okay, and how we communicate and how we give an answer. So in identifying the problem, you can see that there are uh, – Seven elements, really, uh, although we can list them as six. One thing we do is we identify the client. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we are independent, impartial, and objective observers when we go in as appraisers. But we do have a client. Uh, the client we define as the party who engages us. Uh, and we have other intended users. When we identify a party as an intended user, what that means is when we write the appraisal, we write that report so that that party can understand it. We write it at a level that they can understand. So, for example, we may have a, a client, may be the property owner, okay, but he may ask us to write a report that a taking uh, group may uh, might, might want to be able to understand and use. We may identify the uh, property owner as the client, and then identify the taking party as an intended user. Or it could be the other way around where we identify the uh, taking party as the client. That's who we have a relationship with and we're going to protect confidential information with. Okay, uh, And we're going to write a report that other parties can understand because other parties may be uh, needing to take a look at this and make decisions on it. So we'll identify both the client and any other intended users that there are. Uh, we identify the intended use. The reason we do this is the level we go into in an appraisal assignment uh, and the type of information we research and the types of regulations we have to follow uh, all depend on what you're going to do with the appraisal. For example, an appraisal we do for uh, a, a taking is going to have a different set of uh, requirements that we have to meet and different levels of detail that we're going to have to have in them okay, and different factors we're going to have to consider but <clears throat> than, say, someone who gets an appraisal done for a mortgage loan. Uh, you can't take an appraisal that's done for a mortgage loan and say, we're going to use this for a taking. Okay, uh, And we cannot take an appraisal that's done for a taking and say, we're going to use this for a, a mortgage loan. It's not going to have the proper information in it. It's not going to have the proper analysis in it. So when the appraiser is doing this, they talk to their client to find out what they want to do with it. And based on that communication, the appraiser will identify what they intend the report to be used for. Okay, so who they're doing it for, uh, who else may use this, who they intend to use this, and uh, what they're going to use this for, what the intention is of the appraiser. We identify the type and definition of value, and this changes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, for example, uh, in Pennsylvania, PennDOT's definition of market value <coughs> is different than lenders' definitions of market value, which may differ a little bit from the uh, uh, federal land acquisition's definition of market value. So we identify which definition of value we're using. Typically, it's going to be a market value, but we may have other values in there as well. And we identify the definitions we're using for this, because there are slight variances between them. Uh, we uh, identify the effective value date. Uh, once again, this may be the date of taking. Uh, it may be another date that uh, uh, a group has decided to use. Uh, sometimes it is the same date that we inspect the property. So this can vary depending on the assignment and what's appropriate for that particular appraisal assignment. 
uh, we identify the relevant characteristics. And what's relevant to one use may be different than what's relative to a, relevant for another use. Um, I know we just did one for a, a, a pen dot taking, uh, and they are uh, all they're doing is taking a temporary construction easement uh, on a piece of the land. So the relevant property characteristics is really the land value on that particular assignment. Uh, the buildings that are on there are not going to be affected by this by this temporary construction easement at all. Therefore, they're not asking us to value the improvements, just the land, so that they can figure out a just compensation for the piece of land that they're going to put a temporary construction easement on. Uh, the uh, uh, extraordinary assumptions and hypothetical conditions. Um, these are included in assignment conditions. By the way, assignment conditions include more than just extraordinary assumptions and hypothetical conditions. They include laws or regulations that this is subject to. Okay, but we can have extraordinary assumptions. Uh, this is where there's an uncertainty. There's something we're not sure of, and we're going to go in and do an appraisal. Well, we've got to make a decision one way or the other. Either we're going to assume that it has this feature or that it doesn't have this feature if it's an uncertainty. And that's referred to as an extraordinary assumption. Uh, a hypothetical condition is when we know that this is not true. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, what's a property to be worth with a... Uh, an easement going through the property. And we know today the easement does not exist, but the what we need to know is what's it going to be worth with the easement? Okay, since we know the easement doesn't exist, does not exist, we're going to appraise that property subject to a hypothetical condition and say, hypothetically, if there were an easement going through this property, okay, what would be the value of the property with an easement? And then we compare that to what the property is worth as it actually is right now, without an easement, and we get these two values. Okay, so the one is based on something that is not true. It's referred to as a hypothetical condition. Okay, scope of work, do you want to? Okay, uh, scope of work is the type and extent of research and analysis in an appraisal or appraisal review assignment. This is how far we're going to go in doing research. How deep are we going to go into this? Are we going to uh, uh, research uh, sales, for example, uh, where we're going to go in and find from a data source that this sale occurred and maybe look at the uh, uh, legal records and, and to confirm that this sale occurred? Or are we going to go a little bit further and maybe contact the buyer and the seller of the property and interview them to ask them what their motivations were? Just how far are we going to go in, in in researching this data? And then how far are we going to go in in analyzing it? Uh, are we going to do this on a uh, price per square foot basis? Are we going to do this on a price per acre basis? Are we going to take a look at the uh, soil composition to find out what the uh, makeup of the soil is and how productive the soil is? Okay, just how far are we going to go in doing an analysis. Are we going to do a sales comparison approach or is this property, because it's income producing, going to require us to do an income approach and analyze the income production of the property? Okay, are we going to do a cost analysis, uh, which we do in a lot of properties. We're trying to figure out uh, just compensation. Okay, uh, what does it cost to uh, uh, replace the uh, the asphalt that's going to be taken up. What's going to cost to replace the building that's going to be torn down? Okay, what are the costs of these different buildings are going to be affected? So we may be looking at the sales comparison approach, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, income approach, the cost approach, but it goes beyond that. It's how deep do we go into each of these approaches? How deep do we go in in our research? Okay, how extensive is the research for this? And it varies from one assignment to another. Uh, sometimes we'll get people who will call up and ask us to do an appraisal, and they'll want usually what they want to know from us is two things: how much is it going to cost, how long is it going to take. And sometimes we'll give them a time period, and they'll say, "Well, 
I thought appraisals could be done in two days. It's like, well, not your appraisal. Okay, not with the type of research, not with the type of scope of work that you have. Okay, we're going to have to go out and research this data and then verify this data, run all these different types of analysis because of what your assignment is. Uh, doing an appraisal for, for a taking, for example, once again, is different than doing an appraisal for a mortgage loan. Okay, or doing an appraisal for an estate who just wants to know uh, how they should dispose of this property. And it varies based on the on the type of property as well. When we're taking a look at scope of work, it is affected by all those things that are in the assignment. The relevant property characteristics. Different properties take different amounts of time, different research, different uh, extents of uh, analysis that we're going to do on that uh, research. Uh, the uh, confirmations we have to do vary quite a bit. Uh, for different clients, we have different requirements. Uh, different regulators have different requirements to require us to complete different scopes of work. Okay, uh, for uh, different intended uses, they're going to vary. So all those things that were in the identification of the problem, they set the stage for what we're going to be doing in that scope of work, planning how we're going to go out and research everything to come up with the answer to the question. Okay, to, to solve this problem. And the third step we're going to look at is the uh, idea of this uh, data collection analysis. Every time we do an appraisal, it starts off with analyzing a market. Okay, where buyers, sellers, renters, tenants interact with each other. We have to identify the market for the subject property. Okay, and what's going on in that market. Okay, what the trends are. For example, right now, what COVID is doing to the market, okay, is part of the analysis that we would do. But we take a look at the, the market, and based on what the market is doing, we determine a highest and best use for the subject property. And that is the use we're going to value the property at uh, for, for most assignments, for market value assignments. Uh, so for highest and best use, we're going to look at that property and say, if it were vacant, what would what would be the best possible thing you could do with it? What would give you the biggest return to the land? Then we look at it and say, with the current improvements on it, what's the best thing you could do with this that would net the property owner the most money? Okay, which would resolve in the highest net to them. Uh, and then the, the, uh, do those two analysis, and then we determine based on that, how we're going to analyze it. Uh, is this a property that's going to appeal to uh, uh, a, an owner-occupant? Okay, and then we may say that, well, because it appeals to an owner-occupant, we're gonna primarily look at uh, sales comparison when we're doing this appraisal. Or for that highest and best use, if that would appeal to uh, an investor who would be looking for an income stream, then, our next thing would be we want to focus on the income approach on this particular property because that's what the market for this is looking at. Okay, or we may be looking at it saying this is a special purpose property. Okay, this is not something that uh, there's an active ongoing sales market for. Okay, people are not purchasing this for income. Uh, they're purchasing this special property because of a special use they have. And we may be looking more at a cost approach when we get into that. And so then we're, we're looking at doing these approaches to value. And these are the primary approaches to value. The cost approach, the sales comparison approach, and the income approach. Uh, some people, to remember what they are, they'll use uh, a little initialism. They'll call it CSI. Okay, so we do the, the cost, the sales comparison, and the income. Sometimes we do all three of these approaches. Sometimes we do two approaches. Sometimes it's all based on one approach. Uh, we have to look at this, and an important word for appraisers is the word credible. We have to make sure that whatever we do is worthy of belief for the intended use. That's our minimum bar we have in developing an appraisal. So if it is necessary to be worthy of belief to do a cost approach, a sales comparison approach, and an income approach, we do all three approaches. 
if it's only necessary to do a sales comparison approach because of the type of property it is and the market that it appeals to, we may just do a sales comparison approach. Once again, that uh, test for credibility is always based on the intended use. Okay, so depending on what you want to use it for and different groups will require different approaches to be done. Okay, if it's necessary for them, then it's necessary for us to complete that approach. Once we get these three approaches done, we then reconcile these. We take a look and say, we've got indications from different sources about what the value of the property is. Uh, in the reconciliation, we take a look at all these different indicators that we have. And when we say, based on the assignment that we have, the best approach in this particular case is this one. Based on the amount of data we have, uh, how much support we have for that, how important that is to the market. Okay, for example, if we're doing an income producing property where the owner of the property, somebody buying this property is gonna base their pricing decision on how much income it produces, then the income uh, approach is probably the most important approach and we're gonna focus on it and reconcile towards that number. Uh, on the other hand, if it's an owner occupied property uh, where the owner occupants, uh, people buying it for owner occupancy, are going to look at what other properties are selling for. And they're gonna make their decision based on what other properties are selling for. We're gonna base it on the sales comparison approach primarily. We'll take a look at the other approaches as well, but we're gonna base it primarily on the uh, sales comparison approach. Uh, if you have a special purpose property where they, there are not competitive properties out there, and not purchasing it for the income stream, we may be focusing on the cost approach for that particular property. Uh, you'll see that uh, uh, in some of the takings for certain buildings, they'll use a depreciated cost to come up with a compensation for that. Uh, because this is not something where I can go out and sell just this one building on my site. Okay, there's not an open market for that. So the sales comparison may not work but a cost approach may be the appropriate way to value that particular item. Um, we go into reporting to define value. Okay, so we're writing a report. We have different levels of reporting. Uh, we write a report that will allow the client and any intended user to understand what we have done. Okay, we write a report that can be understood by the client and the intended users. A level of detail is gonna vary based on what the client's needs are and what the other intended users might need for this. Okay. So, that, by the way, that's my quick overview of the appraisal process. But what we're hoping to do is answer any questions you guys might have. Well, we did have one question in the chat. It says, does the release of an easement have a positive effect on a property value? And if so, is there a general sense of how much that typically is? Okay. Does a release of an easement uh, have an effect on the uh, value of the property? And if so, how much? Uh, you're gonna love my answer to this, it depends. Okay, it, it, is, it is individual on every single piece of property. Sometimes a release of an easement has no effect on value whatsoever. The easement doesn't really affect the value, okay? Uh, in, in reality, okay? Uh, I know that when we're looking at compensation, it's hard to believe that anything that's taken away from you doesn't have some value. But some easements really don't limit you very much. Other easements can really limit the use of the property and have a huge impact on the value of the property. So it depends on what the easement is for. Uh, basically what we need to do is to, to support this, we'll analyze different properties with different easements and see what the variance in value is. Uh, I have a, a friend of mine uh, who uh, did a study uh, on uh, oil transmission lines. Uh, and he did, it's a multi-year multi study just to look at uh, what these easements have done to the values of these properties. Uh, in some cases, he finds out that, you know, in certain land, it didn't have much of an effect uh, at all. 
other land, it really limits the use of the property, especially when you cannot put a, a building there, okay? And it may have a, a huge impact because you say the highest and best use, if this easement didn't exist, would be uh, to put this type of an improvement on there. But with the easement, you can't do it. You cannot build over top of that uh, easement, okay? Therefore, you have eliminated what should have been the highest and best use. And the new highest and best use is something totally different because the easement exists. So it just depends on what the easement is uh, and on what property it's located. Uh, there is no like set uh, formula where you say it's going to have this much of an effect. Okay, you have to analyze each individual property to find out what that easement is doing to that property. And the way, once again, the way we try to analyze that is we try to find sales of properties with similar easements on it, uh, on them, and see how they differ from properties that did not have easements, and then what it's going to, how it's going to limit that particular piece of property. Uh, an easement may make it so that the property isn't saleable at all. It may take away 100% of the value. Uh, on the other hand, it may have a very minimal effect on the value of the property, depending on where it's located and how it limits the use. Do we have any other questions? Um, would a would you guys take into consideration in uh, doing an evaluation of a property compensation that already existed for a, an easement? So, like, let's say you had a a 50 foot easement going across a piece of property that's been compensated for. Is is that money for a future? Is that taken into consideration down the road in the evaluation? Okay. For, yeah. For a possible another another easement, or for just a, a a sale of a piece of property that you know, the landowner was was paid fifty thousand dollars for this easement. Now you've got that property up for sale, and uh, is that taken into consideration and in, in possibly that, the appraisal? That for he the has easement? already received fifty thousand dollars for it. Correct. Uh, typically, we do not. Okay. Once again, it comes down to analyzing. Um, you have to look at this from the buyer and seller's perspectives. Okay, from the buyer's perspective, um, does it matter that the seller got paid for this easement? Or that he didn't get paid? Or how much he got paid? It, it really doesn't matter to that new buyer what that seller got compensated for for the easement. Okay, what we want to know is what's the effect on the, to the market of having a property with this easement on it. Uh, maybe maybe the uh, the seller did really well and negotiated extremely well when he got paid for his easement, okay? That doesn't matter in this subsequent uh, transaction. Or maybe the seller uh, accepted far below what he should have gotten for the easement. He did not have that uh, uh, valued properly whenever the easement was taken from him, okay? That doesn't matter to us. What we care about is in today's market between the typical buyer and the typical seller, how's that easement going to be viewed? Uh, what What is the probable effect on the sale price of a property because it has the easement, regardless of what someone paid for it before? Any other questions? Mark, this is David. Have you been yes, asked by clients to appraise subsurface minerals? I, so they want to know what the mineral values are. Yeah, have you have you had any of those types of clients? We get we get them. Uh, we actually refer them to another appraiser. Um, uh, doing the uh, Mineral rights is not something that we have focused on. There are a number of appraisers out there. Uh, I, I know one uh, gentleman uh, from central Pennsylvania the, whose company specializes in this. And basically what he does is he hires geologists and then trains them as appraisers. Uh, there are people in Kentucky who do this. There are people in West Virginia who do this. Uh, they are appraisers who have, usually have a background in geology as well, and they specialize in appraising mineral rights. Uh, 
uh, mineral rights is not something that uh, we have focused on. Uh, so generally, we'll give you a list of names and say, here are some people who do it. Uh, I am sure that uh, because I've been to some uh, IRWA meetings in Kentucky, and I know that they have members <clears throat> who are appraisers who specialize in mineral rights. Um, as a follow-up, I, I used to have to, I was a permanent agent in a former life for seismic exploration, and I found myself having to value crops. What are the, uh, what, what's the cash crop in this region that you would find yourself having to value? Okay. Uh, once again, I, I don't do cash crops. I mean, it's more of a personal property uh, okay. appraisal, uh, and they specialize in doing uh, cash crops. Uh, so we don't get into it that much. I mean, I've done you places do land, where we you have do done surface and buildings. What's that? You do surface, surface and, and the infrastructure on the surface. Yes. Okay. Uh, and once again, if it has an easement coming through it, we do value those. What happens when you have, uh, for example, uh, a, uh, a a gas transmission line coming through a property? What does it do to the value of the surface property? Um, I, real quick, if you mind stop sharing your screen so we can uh, everybody can see, especially for the recording for a little bit. Um, uh, Mark Mark Jr., um, did you ever get an answer to the uh, the grade of a of that commercial driveway complex that you were researching a while back? It was to find an engineer. Okay. You want, you want to give a recap real quick of uh, another aspect of, of the appraisal? So we were doing a, a taking that was changing the entrance to a building, which changed the grade. And for this place, they dealt a lot with, um, what were they actually doing? They were taking, they, they did a They were a, an that, HVAC uh, yeah. uh, supply company. Uh, and they had to have the equipment delivered and they had to ship things out from this so the grade, their facility. The grade of the entrance affected the value, or not just necessarily the value, what you could do to the building. Could you get an 18-wheeler into the building? Could you get a, a box truck into the building? <coughs> so we were trying to figure out the grade, but we wound up doing something different. What was it because of the, uh, couldn't access, you couldn't access part of the building anymore properly. So that's how we were able to deal with the change in value of the property. They wouldn't be able to access it with the type of delivery trucks that they use in their business uh, coming in there. So it changed the highest and best use for what types of facilities could go in. But it's not always, it's not necessarily the, that would be a business value for a bargain value to look at the highest and best use of the building and value it that way. So I guess also like the, the turn radius actually to, to access their access point would, would value, be included in that evaluation as well or best use purpose down the road. You and I were also discussing having to hit the brake or not too for the turn. Whether or not the drivers really want to hit that brake. You know, I was working on a project in Ohio that water trucks like to dispose of water with the least amount of gear shifting as possible. So when we were looking for access of places uh, for for water uh, locations, that was one of the things that we took into fact was how many times that the drivers would actually have to shift their trucks. Um, do we have any other questions? I have a question. This is Michael Lopez. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, um, do uh, how long are the appraisals good for in terms of length of time before there's you see an adjustment in the, in the property? <clears throat> the the fun answer is it depends. Uh, mortgages have a different life, a shelf life. Um, I mean, the, the value is good as of the effective date. How long someone will use an appraisal for is usually a regulatory thing. Takings are how long? Does it depend on the taking too? Yeah, it depends on yeah. what that 
uh, governing body has down to their dates. But generally what we're doing when we do an appraisal is we're doing it as of a date. It's good on that date. Okay. Now you can use it forever for a value on that date. For example, you, if, if today you wanted to know what the value of this property was five years ago, the appraisal five years ago could still be used to decide what the value was five years ago. You just can't use it for what the value is today. Uh, you, you can see that sometimes we have very volatile markets where they change very quickly. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, for some certain types of properties right now, uh, restaurant properties, I don't know if I would use a very old appraisal of a restaurant property with everything that's happened with COVID and with the marketability that's happened over the past year. Okay, just, just the values change. On the other hand, you've got other properties that aren't as affected by that. And you may say, you know, I know that value was as of a year ago, but this market stayed pretty flat and I'm okay with just extending the use of this out to another date. When they give you an appraisal, it'll, it'll have on it, here is the effective date of this appraisal. That means that's the date the value is based on. That doesn't mean that's what it's going to be worth afterwards, and it doesn't mean that's what it was worth before. I know that we get, uh, uh, in a lot of our appraisals, we have a, a COVID statement, uh, and we remind people in the COVID statement that there was a worldwide pandemic that's uh, changing a lot of the dynamics in uh, real estate, and that the clients are uh, reminded <clears throat> that the value that we have on here is good as of the effective date. That doesn't mean it's what it's worth after that date or that that's what it was worth before that date. This is just our opinion of what the value was on that date. Things sounds change. to me like then, it seems to me then uh, 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 for Michael's purposes, if all else stays the same, then the change could simply be the time value of money. Other than that, there's a thousand things that can change the value in only 24 hours. There, there, there's things that can change. Yeah, there's kind of a classic example. Uh, September 10th, 2001, downtown New York City, value on a property is different than September 12th because something major happened, okay? We had September 11th, okay, that happened in between there. Other markets, there'll be very little change over time, okay? For different types of property, there's very little change. But some markets are very volatile. They go up and down very quickly uh, based on what the <clears throat> demand is for that type of property. Uh, one of the things you find that get affected the, the quickest is land values uh, when markets are volatile. Land values will fluctuate uh, rather quickly. So it depends on what you're appraising. Did you, um, do you do residential housing appraisals? We do, yeah. It's probably about 60% uh, of our business is residential. So my question is- 60, 40 split. My question is if I'm a home buyer and I'm paying for an appraisal, that's proprietary information. That's not shared with, if there was another buyer, for example, uh, wanting to buy that same house, correct? If I pay for the okay, appraisal, it, that's, my, that's my information. Well, it depends on who hires us, okay, who our client is, because that's who we have confidentiality with. So, for example, most, uh, uh, residential appraisals, we get hired by a bank to do an appraisal for the bank to making a le lending decision. And the only right. people we give that to is the bank. We won't even give it to the borrower. And we okay. will not give that to the buyer. We'll give that to the bank because that's who our client is. The bank will then give them a copy of that appraisal. But let's say you wanted to buy a property. You wanted to make sure that the offer you made was reasonable. Okay. You hire us, you're our client. We will only give that to you, okay? 
Now there are a couple of exceptions. Here's the exceptions. <clears throat> Anyone that you authorize us to give it to. If you specifically say, I want you to give a copy to that person, we'll give it to that person, okay? Any state enforcement agency, okay? As an appraiser, I'm certified to do appraisals in the state. If the state enforcement agency asks for a copy of it, I'm required to give it to them, okay? Uh, I belong to a professional organization. I belong to the Appraisal Institute. If I'm a subject of a peer review study, okay, where they want to look at my work, I'm required to give that to them. They're not allowed to give it to anybody else. And then if we go to court and I get a court order, okay, where the court orders me to bring an appraisal to court, I have to bring the appraisal to court. Okay. But that's my it. Question, I mean, those are the only exceptions. My question was based, I have a real estate background. And so as a seller of a home, then you have multiple buyers. One buyer who gets an appraisal done, uh, that appraisal is not public information for another buyer. They have to pay for their own, correct? They're, they're, gonna, they're gonna have to get their own appraisal done. Now, okay. once again, there's always exceptions to everything. Um, <clears throat> for example, if you do something for an FHA loan, then the FHA is also listed as an intended user and the uh, banks who work with the FHA are required to release reports to other banks making loans on that property so there there can be an exception in there usually though yeah it's yeah they're going to get their own appraisal done yeah what what one appraiser comes in at a certain number and then another borrower comes around another buyer comes along and they go to uh, a bank and they ask for an appraisal, they order a new appraisal, typically it's from a totally different appraiser, and they have no idea what that first appraiser did. We do not communicate that with each other. We don't communicate that with the, with, with the banks or, or anyone else. Matter of fact, if another bank called me to do an appraisal of your property, I'm required to tell them I have appraised that property. Okay, I just appraised that two weeks ago but I cannot tell them how much I came in at. I can't tell them any of the, my conclusions or results because those are all confidential with my first client. So I can't tell them any of the conclusions I came in at with the first client. Thank you. I don't know if that helps or not. <laughs> I appreciate it, thank you. Well, do we have any other questions we'd like to ask Mark and Mark? Uh, jo Johnny, I have a question. Go ahead, Alex. Um, you had one of your slides, you had the, a few different um, appraisal methods of appraising. So for instance, cost, and then I think that the second one was sales. And then I was interested in what the, the third one was. You can go into a little detail of. Oh, the, the income approach. The income approach, yes. So that can vary on the property type as well. It's bigger with commercial properties. There's either usually a direct capitalization approach or a discounted capitalization approach. So it depends on the type of, uh, of the property and the type of the lease. Yeah, let's say the property is leased up, you'll do a direct capitalization approach. If it's not leased up, we usually do a discounted cash flow analysis. Uh, we're okay, so you're working at at all the, the potential future cash flows discounted back to present value. Correct. Life analysis. That's what gets pretty complicated and, and it's a whole nother, probably a whole nother presentation we could do just on this kind of cash flow. In, in direct capitalization, which is uh, probably the more common one, we're looking at one period's income. It's, it's typically a one year income. And then we convert that to value by getting a capitalization rate from the market. Uh, so I mean, it's kind of a simple formula. It's, it's uh, the income equals rate times value. So if we take the income divided by a capitalization rate that we get from the uh, market, we can get an indication of the value of the property. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's referred to as direct capitalization, one period's income converted to a value. Uh, this kind of cash flow, generally we're looking at this one, you have an expectation that incomes are gonna vary. 
um, if we're going to do an appraisal of a uh, proposed subdivision, we'll usually do a discounted cash flow because you're going to have losses in money during the first few years while you're building, you're putting the subdivision together. Yeah. And then once you have it built up, you can start selling them off so you get positive incomes over a period of time. So we just take all those income flows and discount them back to a present value. Once again, right. getting rates from what we see going on in the market. So they, we have these different approaches. Cap, income capitalization by definition is the conversion of income to value. Uh, the concept is they're related, okay? That the income you can generate from this property is related to what someone will pay for it. And we just find that connection to come back to what, what the value is based on income. Okay, interesting, yep. That was a good question. Um, just to let everybody know that the IRWA offers four classes on um, appraisal. So you've got, the, they're in the course 400s. So you got 400, 402, 403, and 411. I think for uh, a lot of us, um, the uh, 403 is the uh, uh, easement evaluation course, and then uh, 411 is the appraisals concepts for, for the negotiator. So those would be uh, the things that would be probably very interesting to, to look into taking those courses. Um, and course 400 is a, a requirement on the accreditation path. Um, so if you'd like some more information on uh, the RWA's courses, please let me know. Um, and we do have a course scheduled for Monday, uh, May 10th. And that's course 213. Um, so the, that registration is now <coughs> open. I'll be sending out some more information on that. Um, and that's that's the one thing that helps build our chapter is is have people on accreditation course uh, path and taking courses that we host. Um, so just to throw that out there, and if you have any questions on any IRWA courses, you can let let me know, and I will get you the information if I don't know it. Uh, we would like to thank Mark and Mark for their time today. Um, and then uh, I'll be sending out everybody's contact information most likely tomorrow afternoon. So if you have any other questions, you can feel free to ask them. I know uh, somebody had to get off the call that had a bunch for you guys, but he had an interview at 12 uh, for a new hire, so he couldn't stay on long enough. Um, also, I'd like to remind everybody next month, uh, Jim Garner will be our speaker and talking on drones. Uh, so that will be uh, on uh, May 11th. And then um, if anybody's interested, we have our Region 5 form. That's the region that uh, the Pit, Pit Row Chapter 88 will be a member of once we get our full approval. And that is April 24th. If you would like to uh, join, let me know. Uh, the spring form will be virtual this year. So um, it is an all-day event, and I uh, encourage people to uh, maybe attend for a little bit just to kind of see the uh, the next level of uh, the ins and outs of the IRWA and, and what uh, uh, we'll be uh, participating on a regular basis as we get our, hopefully our chapter ship approved here in June. Um, so uh, let's a uh, big round of applause for our speakers today. You got your mics on or virtually. John, um, got a question. And yes. Um, our, our first non-virtual meeting in June, I think you said? Correct. Uh, do we have a location yet? That'll be at the AC Hotel in South Point. That'll be June 15th. AC Hotel. Uh, yeah, it's right across from, I believe it's right across um, from uh, South Point Golf Club. Or it's cl pretty close. Okay. It's cl in that area. Um, it's right across uh, from 1400 Main. It's a, it's a new hotel that they just built. So it's right okay. across the, the apartment building, right before you get to the restaurants. Okay. Yeah. By Jimmy Johns. Yeah, over in that area, yeah. yeah. <laughs> On Main Street, then. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, I was completely wrong then. Wouldn't be the first time, won't be the last. That'd be on the south end of the uh, of South Point. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So we'll be doing that with Nayla. Um, uh, we haven't nailed down the topic. We, we, we've got a topic that we'd like to present, so we're working on getting a speaker for that. And as soon as we have that and the registration is open, again, we'll let everybody know. 
Um, and then we're looking to add, uh, we've got speakers up until August, so we're looking for speakers into September and beyond. So if you have any, uh, any um, topics you would like us to pursue or you have somebody that would like to speak or you would like to speak, uh, please let us know as uh, we all learn from each other. Um, I, I think this, this, you know, this appraisal is, there, we could go longer and there's probably a lot of, a lot of good information that we all should know. Um, that we could we could dig deeper into, and maybe we'll come back and revisit this, you know, sometime down the road, and have a, an appraiser 201 course or uh, presentation. So, um, if anybody else has any other questions, uh, speak up now, or uh, you can drop me an email, and we'll we'll address those after the the luncheon. All right, I'd like to thank everybody for their time and their continued support of Chapter 88, the Pit Row Group, and look forward to seeing you guys uh, in May. Thank you guys very much.